Hello and welcome. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm Jessica Deer, the Director of Ranking Digital Rights, and all of us at Ranking Digital Rights in New America are so glad you could join us for charting the future of big tech accountability. This has been another dizzying year for those of us watching digital platforms with very little certainty about what's next. Since our ranking, since our last ranking, we have seen the fallout from the events of January 6th at the US Capitol in terms of prosecutions and also what platforms can do to better prevent and address the abuse of their platforms. Vaccine disinformation became the next chapter in the global COVID pandemic, costing more lives and adding to the growing distrust of our institutions and platforms. New legislation in China, Europe, Russia, India, and elsewhere will have wide-reaching conflict, wide-reaching impact as the disparate visions of how to achieve digital transformation and preserve national sovereignty threaten a global interoperable internet. Whistleblower leaks affirmed what so many of us in civil society have suspected for years regarding just how much Facebook knows about the harms it contributes to, whether by amplifying feelings of inadequacy among teen girls, facilitating illegal and human drug trafficking through ads or not allocating enough resources to effectively moderate content in most of the world. Apple and Google announced big changes to the way they will use our data to target ads, perhaps better protecting privacy, but also solidifying their monopolistic positions. And Facebook has announced its plans, or meta, to move us all into its metaverse. And since February 22nd of this year, tech companies and a wide range of other companies too have used their economic and information power to aid states in imposing sanctions on Russia's government and oligarchs in Putin's, in Putin's ongoing illegal and inhumane invasion and occupation of Ukraine. And if that's not enough, just last week, the world's richest man made a bid to purchase Twitter, throwing the company's future into doubt and reminding us all once again that these companies are not democracies or public squares. They are all but kingdoms under the control of a very few wealthy individuals whose accountability to their users, their shareholders, and to society often appears in the guise of slick PR campaigns or exorbitant lobbying spins or as an act of benevolent, can we call it, techno dictatorship. Today, our esteemed group of panelists have kindly agreed to take the time to pause with us after the launch of our 2022 Big Tech Scorecard last week to reflect on the results of our ranking and the implications of corporate power in the tech sector for our collective future and the future of big tech accountability. Next slide, please. Every year at RDR, we try to make sense of an increasingly complex array of company policies and practices and their potential impact for our fundamental rights to privacy and free expression against the backdrop of world events that not only implicate, but are also influenced by corporate power and particularly tech power. Or as our company and engagement manager, Jan Ridzak puts it, we link companies' transparency or lack thereof to real life harms. We do this by evaluating the publicly disclosed policies and practices of the world's most powerful platforms and telecommunications companies, according to a set of 58 standards that are grounded in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. We then use those evaluations to calculate scores and produce our annual rankings. Next slide, please. This year, we have split what was formerly known as the RDR Corporate Accountability Index into two parts and renamed our rankings as the Big Tech and Telco Giant Scorecards. We did this to dive deeper into each type of platform we evaluate to create more time throughout the year for us to, for us as an applied research outfit to work with partners to put our methods and data into action and to give us not one, but two moments in a year to hold companies account publicly. We have also made several enhancements to our rankings this year, and you can find the link to our rankings in the bottom right-hand corner of the event page for this event, um, or go to rankingdigitalrights.org. And ex we've expanded the highlight section of our individual company scorecards to include more context on each company's performance and added, and added new metadata, such as share structure. We have also added new ways to view our data in the Data Explorer section of our website. And we are introducing a new look at our data called lenses that aim to offer insight into specific areas of interest, such as algorithmic transparency and targeted advertising. You might also notice that RDR has a new look. We have new brand 
and a uh, new visual uh, and a new website. Next slide, please. Uh, to set the stage for our incredible panel, we thought it would be a good idea to review some of the highlights from our recent scorecard. But first, I'd also like to express our immense gratitude to our funders, without whom none of, without whom none of this would be possible. And they're mentioned here on the screen and also on our website. So thank you very much for your support. I'd also like to remind you that RDR takes no funding from any of the companies we rank, that we may rank in the future, or their competitors. And with that in mind, if you find our work valuable and you're able, we kindly ask you to help it make it more sustainable by making a donation. There's a donation button on our website. Next slide, please. So let's get into it. Today, we'll share a few of our favorite findings, but with a data set that gathers information on more than 300 aspects of policy and practices for both companies and their services, you will no doubt find many others when you peruse this year's scorecard on your own. Again, you can find it at rankingdigitalrights.org. Next slide, please. So here are the results, the top level findings. The headline, unfortunately, is that big tip Big tech keeps failing us. For the sixth year, no digital platform that we've ranked has earned a passing grade. While we see incremental process, progress, this is no time for business as usual, and companies must do better to protect their users and the public interest. You'll see that US companies still dominate the top half of our ranking with only uh, Korea's cacao breaking into the top seven and tying Apple for sixth place. You'll also see that the Chinese and Russian companies that we rank, along with Samsung and Amazon, round out the bottom half of the scorecard, though they do, some of them do post significant score improvements. Next slide, please. Top to bottom, Twitter again took the top spot. This is for the second year in a row for its detailed content policies and public data about moderation of user generated content, but it still has a lot of room to improve. Amazon ranked last again, but did post a notable score increase, and it tied Chinese behemoth Tencent. Amazon earned our lowest score among all social media platforms we rank, or all platforms we rank on our standard, asking companies to explain their processes of enforcing their own content rules, which is an area where many platforms don't do well. Google had the fewest improvements, and for the second year, uh, and, and saw its, own, its overall score decline due to outdated policies on notifying search service users of content restrictions and encryption for Gmail and Google Drive. Next slide, please. So we like to look um, year over year. We're one of the only um, or the only initiative that collects data uh, longitudinally year over year. And we like to compare from year to year to see who has improved, of course. And this year, we're pleased to see that 13 of the 14 digital platforms that we evaluated have made some progress since our last index, which was released last February, February 2021. The most improved was Yandex, uh, Russia's search giant on their its overall score, um, although some of those improvements may be in jeopardy given recent events. And Amazon, as I mentioned, also improved its internal governance mechanisms to protect privacy, uh, giving it a, a, a respectable score increase. Least improved again is Google for its decline and Samsung, uh, which basically maintained the status quo. For next slide, please. It's also interesting to look at our year on year data to identify where most of the improvements are coming from. And with some exceptions, um, and what we can say is that many digital platforms that are headquartered outside the United States have led year over year changes, both this year and in the previous year. Chinese companies Baidu and Tencent uh, both gained nearly three points this year. And as we mentioned, uh, the Russian search giant Yandex uh, gained 7.6 points, thanks to policy improvements in all three of our categories, which are governance, freedom of expression, and privacy. Next slide, please. We're disappointed, however, to see that human rights due diligence at the companies is still falling short. Where the arrow is pointing is a combination of the scores on one of our indicators that measures 
uh, disclosures around human rights due diligence. And unfortunately, while some companies do well in evaluating government regulations uh, for the human rights impacts um, that they may present, they don't do very well in evaluating the other three areas that we look at, including policy enforcement of a platform's own rules, their algorithmic development policies, and their targeted advertising practices. Next slide, please. We also like to call out that we're seeing that, that, that data breach protocols, we still aren't seeing a consistent response on these. And unfortunately, or interestingly, both Amazon, our bottom company, and Twitter, our top company, disclose absolutely nothing about data breach protocols. All we ask for is, does a company clearly disclose that it will notify relevant authorities when a data breach occurs? Does it disclose its process for notifying the people who are affected? And does it disclose what kinds of steps it will take to address the impact of a data breach on users? We think that this should be an easy place for companies to improve. Next slide, please. Companies are also stonewalling on algorithms. As you can see here, and I'll point on the left hand of the slide is a, our chart, our lens, one of our new features this year on algorithmic transparency, which combines several indicators um, from our governance, free expression and privacy categories to give us a snapshot of how companies are doing on a specific issue area. And here we can see that no company scores above 22%. In addition, on the right-hand side, you can see a graph that you can also look up on our website if you go to our indicator section, looking at a specific indicator on access to algorithmic system development policies. And I think the outcome is pretty clear. Um, only Microsoft earns any credit on this indicator and it's very little. Next slide, please. Similarly, we have little progress on targeted ads. Both uh, last year for our uh, 2020 index, um, we debuted new indicators on both algorithms and targeted advertising. So this scorecard is the first opportunity that we've had to be able to compare to that baseline that we established last year. And we're not seeing very much progress, especially given the amount of news and headlines that have been made around how algorithms and targeted advertising are both creating harms. So for the second year in a row, none of the 14 companies we rank earned more than 50% of the possible points on targeted advertising indicators, and not a single company has announced a comp comprehensive human rights impact assessment of the mechanisms it uses to tailor ads to its users. Additionally, very few companies um, publish any data in their transparency reports about advertising content and advertising targeting policy enforcement, as you can see in the graph on the right. And this is something that we really believe needs to change. Next slide, please. And finally, before we go into our panel, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the ways in which we're taking our data and our insights from our data and turning it into action. Along with our uh, scorecard this year, as we've done in the past, we've published three companion essays um, that take our data and frame it from the perspective of actions that we think we ought to be taking to advance the movement for big tech accountability. The first one is to ban dual class shares and our company uh, and investor engagement manager, Jan Ritzak has written a piece talking about dual class shares and the disadvantage that um, these stock, that these uh, share structures create for shareholders, um, and also uh, outlines a lot of the work that RDR and others have been doing with uh, investor coalitions um, to raise issues of human rights under uh, environmental, social, and governance frameworks. Um, in the middle, uh, we are having, we are, we've identified a focus on ad tech, um, drawing on and building on our 2020, it's the business model reports where we also talked about ads and the need for ad databases. And uh, Natalie Marshall, our policy director has written an essay um, about how governing ads better and uh, would actually help us better govern the internet. Um, it's an excellent read and um, 
frames a lot of the work that we will be working on that, that we'll be doing at RDR. And then finally, our third companion essay written by Jia Zhang is about company engagement um, from the Chinese companies, which uh, are there, we, we rank three Chinese companies, none of whom have engaged with us during our uh, feedback process. Um, our research methodology incorporates uh, a significant amount of company engagement by sharing preliminary results and asking for feedback and sources from the companies we rank. But to date, we haven't heard anything uh, from the Chinese companies and she gives us some very good reasons why. I'll also just note that the only other company that we haven't heard from is Google this year. Finally, the, well, these are some of the ways that RDR sees the future of big tech accountability, but I'll stop here so that our panel can dive into this more. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Natalie Marechal, RDR's policy director, who will introduce and moderate our panel. Natalie is an internationally recognized expert on digital rights, corporate governance, and corporate accountability. She has built our policy team over the last year from the ground up, and she was the lead author of RDR's It's the Business Model Report series from 2020. She has testified in front of the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. International Trade Commission and holds a PhD in communication from the Annenberg School at the University of Southern California and lives in DC. I'm really pleased to introduce you, Natalie, and for you to take it away. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, let's jump right into it. Um, you have our panelists uh, full bios uh, on uh, the registration page, um, but uh, I will tell you just a little bit about them. Uh, Sarah Couturier-Tano is an expert in corporate research and shareholder engagement. She leads dialogues with Canadian and international companies to advance ESG issues, including human rights, decent work, and corporate lobbying. Uh, she's published several issue briefs on current shareholder and policy topics using her insight from her background in non-financial auditing. Jesse Larrick is a co-founder of Accountable Tech. He has a decade of experience in pol political communications and issue advocacy, including serving as the foreign policy spokesman for the Clinton 2016 presidential campaign, where he was part of the team managing the response to Russia's information warfare operation. Chris Lewis is president and CEO of Public Knowledge. Before becoming president and CEO, Chris was the vice president of PK from 2012 to 2019, leading the organization's day-to-day -day advocacy and political strategy on Capitol Hill and with the administration. Katarzyna Shemilevich is an expert in human rights and technology, a lawyer and an activist. She's a co-founder and the president of the Panopticon Foundation, a Polish NGO defending human rights and surveillance society, and one of the leaders in corporate accountability in the EU. Last but certainly not least, Sophie Zhang became a whistleblower after spending two years and eight months at Facebook. During that time, she tried but was not successful in efforts to fix the company from within. She personally caught two national governments using Facebook to manipulate their own citizenry while also revealing concerning decisions made by Facebook regarding inauthenticity in Indian and US politics. So as you can see, we have a really illustrious panel here uh, who's been deep in the trenches of corporate accountability from a variety of angles. Uh, and I'm really, I'm really excited to, to chart the future of our, more, of our movement together with you all. Uh, Jesse, let's start with you. So you're the co-founder of Accountable Tech, uh, which is a campaigning organization working to bring about long-term structural reform to tackle the existential threat that social media companies pose to our information ecosystem and democracy. Tell us about what led you and your co-founder, Nicole Gill, to focus on this issue and what you think this movement has accomplished so far. Yeah, thanks so much for having me today. And uh, I think that you hit the nail on the head even, even in your question when you say an existential threat. Um, and that's really how I've come to view um, disinformation and the current information ecosystem that we live in, uh, in which there is no shared uh, consensus reality, no shared baseline of facts. Um, and social media, I think, has been certainly not uh, the sole, you know, social media platforms didn't invent disinformation or polarization or racism or extremism or echo chambers, but they serve as a, as a unique accelerant on each of those fronts. And as the fabric continues to fray uh, and we lose that ability to have uh, cool, cool headed conversations, to have policy focused conversations, to have fact based conversations, I, I think democracy is, is 
day by day at, at more and more risk. And so we felt, uh, you know, that this, that this was an, an issue area where I think people are starting to recognize that on every, on every issue where they want to see progress, you know, disinformation and the information ecosystem um, serve as a serve to thwart that because um, it is this intersectional issue. It's very hard to win arguments or have a functional democracy or have productive conversations if you cannot even uh, communicate facts. If you can't, um, if you can't reach people, if everything is that is being sort of filtered and warped through a lens. Um, of a few dominant platforms, which are built to optimize engagement, which often means amplifying the most toxic things on the platform and doing it in a way where that's micro targeted to each person to play on their personal biases. So you have this dynamic where it's simultaneously global and ubiquitous, but also unprecedented in how precise and personalized everything is. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we have done everything in our power since we, thought about this <laughs> and stood this organization up to try to fight on all fronts because there is no silver bullet to, to this um, myriad of inter interrelated problems. But I do think, um, you know, we've, we've pushed for direct corporate accountability, trying to call out and educate uh, and educate the broader public on some of the, you know, fundamental uh, flaws that that we're worried about uh, with the dominant social media platforms. We've pushed for, you know, uh, legislation and, and education in the US. We've worked with our friends in, in Europe. And I think um, uh, I'm sure Kasha will get more in depth in on the DSA and DMA that just uh, are making their way through Brussels, but really exciting to see how comprehensive those proposals are in tackling some of the the fundamental harms here, um, and and we're we're seeing uh, progress at the state level as well. Um, when you we were just uh, this, just yesterday, the uh, age appropriate design code uh, in California advanced, and so I think even with the level of fluency that members of Congress are talking about these issues compared to where they were a few years ago, uh, the progress has been has been really significant. And so there's certainly an enormous amount of work to do, but uh, I do think we're making progress. And I'm very grateful for everyone on this panel, yourself included, for helping to drive that. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so, so Kasha, before we get into the the details of uh, the DMA and, and DSA. Um, how does what, what, what Jesse said compare with your experience in Poland and, and Europe more broadly? Can you reflect a little bit on where our movement has taken us so far? Um, yes, I will do my best in the short time we have. Uh, truly, I, I feel we live uh, in, in, in interesting time for, for regulating big tech. Uh, last five years in Europe has been uh, we have witnessed uh, increasing political support for deep reform. Uh, if you go back to what we heard from uh, European Commission uh, leaders like uh, Breton, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, at the beginning of their term, they clearly attacked the very business model behind, uh, behind big tech, uh, engagement-based business model, uh, advertising technology, all that has been clearly set as target for regulation. Uh, the, the being big itself has been uh, seen as risk and something that EU not only should react to with a number of uh, pro-competition, pro-consumer cases, but even uh, preempt with proactive regulation. So that movement um, supported by by whistleblowing, supported by cases like Cambridge Analytica, we still remember that, right? We have new cases since then, but that 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 affair with Cambridge Analytica has been, I think, pretty influential here in Europe in informing political agenda. So on one hand, we have seen incredible movement of policymakers towards critical agenda. On the other hand, if you look at the goals set for the reform we are we are witnessing today, the DMA and DSA together as a package. Well, there are obviously two legs. One is people's empowerment through uh, new tools, uh, the, the new, new, new tools and safeguards. And I will go back to this, how, how much worth that is. On the other hand, there is always, always the, the economic liberal narrative present. Uh, and uh, no surprise, the, the, the deeper we go in, in the reform, the longer it takes, it took two years to work out details, 
the bigger the impact of the market logic. So uh, it's sad, but it's also realistic to say that after two years uh, in the making, that regulation has been uh, in to, to a great extent uh, influenced by big tech's lobbying and the most revolutionary uh, aspects of it, the, 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 the biggest promises uh, have not been uh, implemented at the end. So the, the EU is obviously much further ahead uh, than, than the US in, uh, in, in regulating big tech. Um, having recently finalized both the, the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act, though we won't see the final text of the DSA for a bit longer. And maybe you can help us understand why that is, because uh, I know that for, for, for a lot of our audience and for me, uh, policymaking in Europe is, is a bit of a mystery. So maybe you can help us unpack that a little bit. Uh, can you tell us about these two pieces of legislation uh, and how they, how they change the fight for big tech accountability and uh, maybe give us a short preview of what's coming next in, in Brussels? Yeah, uh, truly it is complicated. Honestly, we as civil society lobbyists only after being in that process, we understand what's really going on there. Uh, very long story short, uh, there are three uh, key bodies involved in the process. European Commission uh, responsible for proposing the reform, European Parliament, which is usually seen as the most progressive body, at least for the sake of um, uh, broad representation of various societal concepts of on, on how to regulate. So we always have the left and the middle and the right, with the middle being the strongest voice. So um, uh, Christian Democrats still dictating more or less the mainstream. Uh, and we have the council, which is uh, the representation of governments. And again, here, the whole variety of uh, opinions, positions, uh, uh, with uh, pending politics being incredibly important. Uh, needless to say, the conflict in Ukraine uh, has uh, opened certain gateways that seem closed and closed the other problems that were important a year ago. So this is all pretty dynamic. We have to observe that. And we know not, not, not always we can because part of this process is extremely uh, non-transparent. Uh, everything that happens in the council and in the trilogue, the trilogue is the moment where the three come together to negotiate the final shape of the legislation. These meetings are mainly technical meetings uh, where only experts sit and they are not uh, expected to leak out the information, which usually happens. So we can predict what will be in the final legislation, but officially we have to wait a month longer maybe three weeks longer uh, after the end of official negotiations uh, to see uh, the final text after the technical people sit down and basically type, um, put on paper what has been discussed behind the closed door. Uh, so whatever we have, uh, what, whatever we say now these days is based on leaks, is based on um, assurances that we received from various stakeholders being more or less public about the process. Ironically, uh, the negotiating, uh, uh, the, the meeting where they negotiated lasted until uh, 2 uh, a.m., uh, well past midnight, uh, but uh, around 12 uh, in the morning, Co Commissioner Breton already um, uh, published on Twitter the whole stream explaining what has been won. <laughs> so, well, the intransparency, the lack of transparency does not prevent PR from happening as, as usual. Uh, so um, this is how it goes. Uh, people uh, comment on this reform without really seeing the, the, the text uh, yet. Okay, so maybe maybe it's best to, to hold off on a deep analysis until we actually see the text then. Um, so what about the US? Um, Chris, what's the state of play here? And uh, what can civil society do to pressure policymakers uh, on this front? Um, is there, might we actually achieve some degree of, of tech accountability through legislation or, or regulation in the US this year? What do you think? I, I think it's challenging. and. and and congratulations, Natalie and, and Jessica, uh, on the, the latest report. Uh, it's fantastic work. Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm optimistic in the long run. I, I'm pessimistic in the short run. I think we're further behind, as you as you noted, we're further behind Europe um, in really understanding uh, where we want to go with uh, accountability regulation in the U.S. And and so I think we need to pick up a pace. Um, unfortunately. Uh, what we've seen in the United States and in Washington so far uh, is a lot of 
focus on small um, one-off fixes to um, to specific things that, that legislators have seen in the news. Uh, some of these, you know, we support public knowledge, and I know others here uh, also support. Uh, but we what we aren't seeing is a real um, framework approach like we're seeing in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, in the long run, that's where I think we need to be. Um, and so hopefully uh, what we'll get out of some of the one-off proposals that we're seeing around privacy and around uh, uh, competition policy and antitrust uh, and algorithmic oversight, um, hopefully that will, will you know, form the basis of how people understand what accountability should look like. And we can move towards uh, more of a framework approach that we're seeing in Europe. Uh, that's my hope. I, there's some real challenges that we face. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think some of the biggest challenges we face in the United States are, are really uh, political and ideological, uh, given uh, the, the atmosphere in Washington these days. Uh, the ideological divide uh, means that it's very difficult for folks to agree uh, on things, and, and that's seeping into a lot of the debate. Uh, so, uh, you know, for example, in the United States, uh, we uh, we know that we will face in tech accountability the challenge of making uh, uh, accountability work with uh, the First Amendment uh, uh, and First Amendment protections. Uh, but unfortunately, we've also at the same time over the last few years seen a real uh, breakdown of the consensus in the United States of what the First Amendment means, what uh, free speech and free expression uh, protections are and should be. Um, and that a lot of that comes out of broader uh, political fights that are really not related to tech policy per se. Uh, but, uh, but unfortunately, it's impacting where people see how people view harms online and, and what solutions they'd like to see. Um, we also run uh, the challenge because so many of the, the companies that we uh, want account, accountability around are based in the United States, there's there's national pride involved. And so uh, often when proposals are put forward, uh, you'll hear folks say, oh, we can't do that because it will hurt the US or it will hurt US companies and our, our competitiveness broadly. I, I think uh, that's very short-sighted uh, and, and hopefully uh, we can, as civil society, help build back our consensus on what the First Amendment and what free expression is and should be. Also build consensus on uh, what a you know, basic understanding of accountability should look like. Um, that's difficult, uh, but, uh, but it's really the challenge in front of us to, to bridge some of the ideological divides that we're seeing in our country right now to, to build a conventional wisdom around some of those ideas. If we can do that, then I think we can get to more of a framework approach. Um, and in, in the meantime, I think we're going to see a few smaller bills go forward, things that promote competition, uh, uh, you know, bills around um, uh, self-preferencing and non-discrimination, uh, bills uh, hopefully around um, uh, platforms like the, the App Store or, or broader interoperability. Um, there's probably going to be a push this summer around privacy, um, but whether parties can come together and agree on what those enforcement structures look like uh, is unclear yet. So uh, we have a lot of work to do. And, uh, and I think civil society, we have a lot of work to help folks who may differ ideologically on, on various issues realize that they have the same issue at stake here, the, the right to, to freely express themselves and to have, have safe communications online, um, even when they disagree with each other. So that's the real challenge in front of us uh, as civil society. Thanks, Chris. I'm, and I'm glad to hear you uh, say that you're optimistic, at least in the long run. You know, I, I, I have a lot of conversations where people who, uh, with, with people who are very pessimistic at, in all runs of time. And, um, you know, for, for me, I, I personally think it's important as, as, as advocates, as, as activists to, to choose to be, uh, to be optimistic, because if you don't have that optimism that, that you can win, uh, you lose the will to fight, right? And I think that's the most dangerous thing for any social movement is to give up, uh, give up the idea that you can win before, before you've even, before you've even tried. Well said, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, shifting gears a little bit away from uh, civil society advocates into different kinds of, um, of change makers. Uh, Sophie, I'm, I'm particularly glad that you could join us today for this conversation because you're one of the very few people out there who has worked inside a big tech company, has left and can speak openly uh, because you're not bound uh, by a non-disparagement agreement since you turned down a, a pretty hefty severance package from Facebook. Tell us why you decided to speak out about your former employer. Thank you. 
Natalie. So just to be clear, I am bound by one non-disparagement agreement that I signed when I joined Facebook. I refused the one I, when I left, so I would be breaking one rather than two. Ultimately, Facebook has this, hasn't sued me because it would look terrible for them and also admit to that everything that I'm saying is true. I'm protected by that rather than me tuning down the money. So, so anyways, I, I worked at Facebook for 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 two and a half years. In my in, in my time though, I I, I caught two national governments red-handed that we that we that were breaking Facebook's pay policies on vast scales and to set up fake personas purporting to be their own citizens to to mislead, to harass, and otherwise repress the fellow citizenry. These were very clear-cut cases in which there was. Ab there was absolutely no moral moral nuance. It was very no no one was defending these on the, these cases on the merits. In other cases, you can say there are real questions at stake. What is the right decision here? Do we know for certain? But the, but none of those were the case here. And Facebook still took almost a year to act in the case of Honduras, and more than a year to act in the case of Azerbaijan. Ultimately, and ultimately, I recently knew that, that I was doing, this was all in my spare time. This wasn't my actual job. No, this was no one's actual job. I had no special training in this area. I'm certainly not a super genius. And the reason that I, some random person out of, out of grad school at her second job, was able to fight, catch two national governments right-handed with no training and no expertise and not being a genius is simply that they were the low-hanging fruit. No one had bother to look at them before so they could be lazy. Ultimately, you can't fix a solution without, without, no, without knowing that it, uh, you can't fix a problem until you know it exists in the first place. And right, and right now, um, on many issues, uh, only Facebook knows precisely what is going on within Facebook, the platform. I don't think it will be a surprise to anyone to say that Facebook is a company. Its goal is to make money. And at, at, at the end of the day, we don't expect Philip Morris to have a division that tries to make cigarettes less addictive, or Philip Morris to have a division that reimburses Medicare every time someone gets lung cancer. The very idea is a bit ludicrous. Imagine a world in which Philip Morris knows that, that cigarettes give people cancer, but Philip Morris is the only person who knows, and Philip Morris is the only person, group that has any chance of finding that out. In that situation, I think it would be very important for someone from within the company to come forward. And so that's precisely what I did and I'm still doing today. Well, thank you for, for your whistleblowing and for your activism, Sophie. Um, one of the things that, one, one thing you said to me when we talked last month that, uh, that I thought was really interesting uh, and that I'd love to, to hear you talk about some more today is that uh, when you brought these concerns to your managers, um, they used the rhetoric of users' rights to resist taking action against these people who were using, including government officials, who were using the platform to hurt other people in various ways. Uh, and it's true that in the early years of the digital rights movement, we were really focused on protecting free expression and privacy for platform users, and perhaps not thinking enough beyond that. What, though I think, I think at, by this point, uh, the conversation has caught up to that. Uh, what kind of messages would you like to see, do you think it's important to see from civil society groups uh, that for us to be sending to companies and to policymakers? What should we be asking for? Absolutely. So just to just to again first provide context. So so so, so when I brought so when I brought these cases up to to, to leadership at Facebook, and often often there were concerns about taking precipitous action without warning without warning people first because 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 in terms of fundamentally users' rights, it's it's about protecting users from the platform. And, but that can become a problem. But when users themselves are the platform, I mean, both both I mean, both are valuable initiatives in the same way that, for instance, police advocates and police reform advocates are both valuable initiatives that are naturally at odds, and give, give, giving suspects more warning before before arresting them, such as the Miranda rights, has in some has in has has reduced false confessions and, re and, and, help and helped protect people from the police, but they have also made it harder for the police to catch people. And that's the analogy that I'm going to use very broadly here. 
An additional facet is that the people is that at Facebook, the people who judge cases, the policy maker, the policy staffers are the same people who are charged with also lobbying governments and political officials and essentially get, getting them on the good side, which is a very different paradigm from that in law enforcement, etc. In the United States, if a judge were called upon to try a case and it turned out that they went for weekly entries with a the defendant, they would be required to recuse themselves, I hope. At Facebook, it would be only be a problem if they didn't know the defendant. I'm being a bit flippant, but I think that gets my point across. Like, and 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 so Facebook had incentives to to protect the the, the important and influential from its own systems under the under 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 the, under the rhetoric of of not of not taking precipitous action, giving people fair warning, etc. And, and like you said, that goes back to the initial viewpoint on accountability for, for tech platforms, that it was about it, accountability for the platform and protecting users from them. I think that, uh, like I've, I've, re I've read the criteria that, that, that RDR uses, and my understanding that most of it is focused on the platform's own transparency about what, about what measures it takes against users, what, what, what protections users have in terms of privacy, in terms of enforcement, etc. And and so and so right now it uh, I, I don't see, it doesn't it doesn't do much coverage of the other facet which is protecting protecting users from other users, protecting protecting users from violations of platform policy that are not being enforced or carried out, which I believe is equally important because right now there is not much there is not much transparency or or visibility into this. So frankly, it's something that I believe would be a good idea for RDR and others similar to transparency groups to do would be to essentially do red team style penetration tests. What I mean is, for instance, RD, I mean, these would have to be done careful, carefully because if you go at it alone, I'm sure Facebook might have will find an excuse to ban you or etc. But in principle, but in principle, accepting those sorts of issues, if you want to, if you want to know, for instance, how good its company is at taking down fake accounts, the best way to do it is to, in controlled test circumstances, set up your own fake accounts and see how many of them are actually taken down by each company, and then you could report afterwards. We set up a hundred net a hundred networks of fake accounts on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, uh, TikTok, etc. Et Facebook took down ten out of a hundred. TikTok took down one out of a hundred. Twitter took down two out of a hundred. They're all terrible, but Facebook is the least terrible. And making up these numbers, obviously, the same approach could be used. For instance, if you're concerned about hate speech, you could set and do controlled circumstances set up hate speech. See what percentage of it is taken down. You could see response to user reports, create violating posts, have people report them, and then see how many of them are taken down. Other people are concerned about social media overreach and taking down posts that aren't violating. You could do the exact same approach, make posts that aren't violating, maybe a bit borderline and unclear and report them, perhaps have report similar posts on different sides of the political spectrum. So, so that if you're worried about political bias and see how many of them are taken down incorrectly, and then you could uh, like, People have done experiments and there's anecdotal discussion of these sorts of issues, but I don't think there has been any systematic approach at it. And I think that would be extraordinarily valuable because right now a lot of people are talking past each other based on anecdotal, based on anecdotal evidence. And when you have 2 billion users on a platform, there would be anecdotal evidence for anything. Those are some really great suggestions for for going beyond our our DR's current uh, research methods and and approach. Uh, you know, obviously, in the kind of indicator based uh, research on public publicly available documents is far from the only research method out there. Uh, and uh, our team is is very much thinking about how we can expand our our current arsenal of, of research tools. And uh, and I hope we can continue talking about this uh, in the in the weeks and months to come, Sophie. Um, now now Sarah, you come from from an opposite. Uh, well, I don't know if, it, if you come from a different perspective of of, of Sophie's uh, working as uh, as as an investor and an advocate. And of course, one of the themes we highlighted in the scorecard is the growing role that investors are playing in tech accountability. Uh, so, Sarah, my question for you is: What's the business case for investors? Why why do investors care about human rights in the tech sector? And what strategies can they use to hold companies accountable? And what strategies have you specifically used uh, to this end? Thank you, Natalie. 
It's true that when you put these two terms, uh, investors and human rights in the same sentence, the general public uh, often raises brow uh, because most people don't really see investors as allies in the fight for human rights or democracy in general. Um, investors, because they are uh, the owners of the companies in which they invest, um, they are in a unique position to push companies in certain directions. Uh, they can leverage their uh, ownership and power, such as uh, their voting rights, for example, to do that. And that's exactly what we do at SHARE. We help um, investors toward their uh, assets in ways that contribute to positive social and environmental outcomes. Um, so now, while it's true that the idea, um, you know, that profit should be the only externality uh, investors should look for when taking investment decision, um, uh, this idea is very prevalent. Sorry, that was my point. Uh, there is still a significant portion of investors, especially institutional institutional investors, that agree on the materiality of other types of externalities, including social, societal and environmental outcomes. And while a few investors would base um, that assessment on moral values and ethics, um, most of investors believe that social or environmental impacts represent risk for the companies uh, and sometimes uh, the economies and societies. And therefore, this risk should be managed. Um, if I take uh, the example of human rights in the tech sector, I must say that uh, it is a fairly new area for most investors, and we see uh, this risk as emerging. And there is a growing um, understanding that we need to pay attention to the way some companies, um, because of their outsized uh, influence on society, may impact human rights and democracies, like Meta Platform, for instance. Or is that also the case for companies that rely um, on the collection and exploitation of personal data, including facial recognition, uh, like Google, for example? So I can take two examples to illustrate uh, what investors can do to support the fight for human rights in the tech sector. Uh, the first example is about meta platforms. Um, it is clear that this company has a human rights problem and um, there are existing human rights risks and probably new risk to come with the development of the metaverse, for instance. Um, and that's the reason why we co-filed a shareholder proposal with other investors, including Adorna Capital, asking the company to conduct a human rights impact assessment on the metaverse. Um, so this proposal will be voted at the next AGM. And basically uh, the rule is that if um, a majority of investors vote in favor of this proposal, uh, good practice is that the company should implement the proposal. Um, now, you know, meta platform is, uh, is a bit strange uh, because, you know, as investors, we believe that this risk or um, human rights risk are amplified by the company structure that uh, concentrates most of uh, the power into Mark Zuckerberg's hands because it has a double function of CEO and chairman. And this means that there is no real check and balance within the company. And this is um, essential in every company to ensure that the management takes appropriate decisions and that the board serves the best interests of shareholders. In Meta Platform's case, shareholders' voice is not heard. Uh, the management and the board have failed at many, many, many occasions to address shareholders' concerns, uh, especially on human rights and governance matters, uh, including when shareholders have, um, you know, um, in maturity voted for some shareholders proposals. Um, so we, a month, uh, two months ago, uh, approximately, we convened a group of 15 investors, including uh, SHARE, that collectively represent 2.7 trillion of asset under management. And we wrote to the company and we asked that they implement certain governance reform that would strengthen shareholders' rights and to not renominate Peggy Alford and Mark Anderson's board members and nominate two truly independent directors instead. So the company ignored our calls uh, for, uh, so the next logical step for us was to um, recommend every shareholders to vote against those two directors to send a clear signal to the board and the management that we need change and that change needs to happen now. Um, so Meta Platform AGM will be at the end of the month. So we'll see the result of this vote. Usually we consider that uh, this kind of vote um, is good when more than 10 to 15% of shareholders uh, voted against di directors. Um, I have another example uh, with Google, but I'm not sure I, I have time uh, to do that. Um, do I have time? Um, 
Yeah, I do. Okay, so I like to use the other example um, of Alphabet. So with the support of uh, the Red King digital team, we designed uh, and filed a shareholder proposal asking the company to conduct uh, what we call a human rights impact assessment to identify and address potential human rights risk that would be uh, created by um, Alphabet's new advertising system called Flock. Um, the company cancelled the implementation of the Flock and decided to implement instead uh, another advertising system called Topics API. Uh, we had a call with members of the leadership team of Alphabet, and they said that uh, they can sell the flag uh, because of um, negative feedback uh, they received from civil society actors, experts, and also investors think, to this proposal. Um, so this kind of you know, proposals and communications between shareholders and companies really help to amplify the voice of um, you know, civil society actors. So we agreed to withdraw the proposal and in exchange, um, the company agrees to commit to meet with us twice between now and October and to include in those conversations members of the ranking digital team. And we hope that with the presence of, um, you know, members of, uh, I mean, these experts uh, that, you know, will be able to, um, to, to move the needle. So I think that what we're doing with meta platforms or even alphabets really illustrates well some tools we have as investors to move the needle and support civil society organizations to push for better human rights in the tech sector. And we know that our um, impact is meaningful, but modest. But I believe that in these circumstances, um, all hands on deck uh, is a necessary approach and investors should play their part. Thank you, Sarah. And I want to remind the audience uh, that uh, we welcome uh, your questions. You can uh, submit them using Slido, which is the box located to the right of the video. Um, so very much looking forward to, uh, to your questions. Um, and I am going to start with an audience uh, question uh, for Sophie. Uh, Sophie, why do you think America focused more on um, the, the whistleblowing and the from uh, Frances Hagen, uh, Hagen on what, what she found versus what, what you identified, uh, given that you, know, you, you blew the whistle first. Why do you think her, her whistleblowing had more, more take up with, um, with the public discourse in the US? I'm not a public relations expert, so it's just personal speculation, of course, not an expert. My guess is that it's a combination of factors. First, first that Francis spoke to issues that uh, spoke to issues that that were more broadly interesting and and, and intriguing to Americans, such as, for instance, teen, teen, for instance, teen mental health crisis, which I mean. I, I frankly, I think that it's more relatable to most Americans that, that, than abuse of Facebook by dictators in Honduras or Azerbaijan. And even, even when I came forward about decisions made in the United States, uh, that, that, was mostly, that was mostly a sideshow which did not come, get much pickup. The, the, second, the, the second aspect I'd point to is that, frankly, I, I was probably Pretty pretty naive when I came forward. I, I thought I would just get, go out there to talk to everyone, and they could and they would dis, could decide on their own whether to listen to me or not. Francis took a more proactive approach of getting of getting P PR support and etc., which frankly was a lot more effective than what I then did, which is why P PR people get paid in the first place, I suppose. I mean. By now it's a bit too late for me, and being is, yeah, and 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 being essentially unscripted, unscripted, and and doing everything myself is essentially my brand now. So, so, so I'm running with it. I do find it a bit funny how how some people how some people criticize Francis for being uh, too prepared and and poised and and scripted, and then they turn around and look at me and say they can't trust her. She stutters. She has an accent. She's not prepared enough. I mean, ultimate, ultimately, some people. People will criticize the messenger when what they dislike is the message itself. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely on point. Um, so in in her in her presentation, Jessica talked about uh, a lot of of you know the big dramatic uh, events of the year that that uh, that that implicate uh, big tech accountability. And um, you know we're, we're we probably don't have time to cover all of them today, but. One thing I want to make sure that we really do talk about is uh, is, is Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and uh, obviously big tech is not responsible for uh, for, for 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 Putin's regime and uh, and and 
you know the the long history of of Russian imperialism. That's that's not something we're going to pin on 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 big tech platforms. But that they haven't they are they are nevertheless implicated in how this conflict is is playing out and how this invasion and brutal occupation is pay, playing out. And uh, and Kasia, you're you're I know you're 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 quite close to the the situation being in Poland and being active active in um, in your Eastern European uh, activist networks. Um, what what can we learn today? Uh, what can we learn about how big tech and tech companies operate today uh, from their recent actions uh, in Ukraine, but also in Belarus, Russia, and the broader region? And um, how should that how should that in, how th should that influence our advocate our collective advocacy agenda? I'm, I'm happy to say that in terms of our agenda, the civil society agenda, including certainly what ranking human rights has been saying for, for ages, we do not need to correct anything. We have been saying this from the very beginning of that conversation. I think that business model uh, is the problem and business model needs to change. The problem is that policymakers, even when they say they are ready to regulate, as they have said in, in, in the EU, and they have declared war against big tech abuses, they are still not exactly ready to attack the core of the business model, which is based on uh, people's uh, engagement, is based on exploiting users' attention, uh, is based on making money from observation, from behavior observations. If we don't attack that, we will not change the machine behind uh, disinformation or or war on information that uh, has escalated um, nowadays in, in my part of Europe. So uh, to our, um, it, it wasn't good news for our movement when we have seen that uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the first weeks of war, everybody, uh, including governments, ha has basically targeted big tech as the solution, asking them to clean uh, certain uh, disinformation agents from the internet to block certain accounts, to block uh, certain people or, or uh, Russian agencies from um, uh, speaking publicly as if it was uh, a way to solve the problem. While we all know that the solution is much, much deeper in the engine of this platform. So speaking to that problem, I can only uh, quickly indicate uh, what we are hoping for in the DSA that might prove to some extent useful in solving that problem, but not radical enough. Uh, first thing, which is also very interesting uh, in the context of what has been said today, we will have um, a, a much more robust uh, risk assessment mechanism in the DSA, meaning that platforms themselves will be expected by the regulator to self-assess risks caused by their business model, including uh, the way they target ads, including uh, social media algorithms and impact of these algorithms and their moderation practices and their targeting uh, mechanisms on democracy, public health, uh, cybersecurity, everything that matters. If they do this risk assessments right, we will no longer need whistleblowing. Obviously, it's just a joke. I know they will not do that well enough because they have no interest to do that well enough. But at the same time, we have European Commission invested in uh, strong enforcement measures able to force a better risk assessment and more interestingly for us here we have new rights for civil society and other independent experts including so-called vetted researchers to demand access to data about all these mechanisms uh, that operate inside of large platforms so hopefully we will be able to question uh, risk assessments when they are not uh, done properly and demand real data about how, uh, for example, social media recommender systems or um, uh, targeting algorithms uh, operate, what type of uh, data they take into account, what type of optimization um, um, targets, uh, you know, the, the big tech users and all that. So uh, hopefully this is a foot in the door for us in Europe and hopefully globally as well to demand more accountability. Finally, again, not radical enough, but interesting measure, there will be limitations on how uh, big tech can target people. Uh, in Europe, we wanted to prohibit essentially the use of observed data about humans because we believe that hardly ever people would authorize behavioral observations to be used against them, to manipulate them with the use of sponsored content in general. 
Uh, unfortunately, that proved too radical uh, in the debate we had uh, in Brussels, but what we want is a partial ban on the use of sensitive data, including observed sensitive data, uh, and any data about children. So again, not radical, far from what we wanted, but uh, a foot in the door of uh, uh, changing the most toxic aspects of that business model. Right, and of course, this the uh, you're referring to a ban on surveillance advertising, which is something that um, that uh, I know that uh, Accountable Tech and uh, and Ranking Digital Rights uh, both support. Uh, now, here's a question from the audience, and I think uh, either either Chris or or Jesse uh, could could take it. Um, what uh, would you have a sense of how American lawmakers are viewing the the deeper European reforms that Kasha was just talking about, and uh, and what would it take uh, to uh, to 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 get uh, to get U.S. lawmakers to uh, to move in that direction here? Uh, question for either of you, and if the other one wants to build on what the first one says, please go for it. Yeah. Do you want to? I'm happy to happy to jump in first, and then you can. Uh, say something more eloquent after me, Chris. <laughs> but I, th I think the, we're trying to do some education around the DSA and DMA right now, because I think, frankly, a lot of lawmakers' reaction uh, in the U.S. to the DSA and DMA is uh, not really knowing what it is. And uh, I think Chris alluded earlier to sort of like the uh, uh, gut reaction, uh, reflexive um, opposition that um, I think we still sort of have here in the U.S. when especially, you know, regulation is sort of sacrosanct here as it is, but certainly when, you know, the Europeans are regulating our great American companies, I think there's sort of an antiquated uh, sentiment from Washington that it's their role to, to jump to the defense of, you know, big tech's bottom line. Um, but I think one of the interesting things, and we've put together, I'm happy to circulate this to the community afterwards, but we put together actually a memo that really runs through. Uh, one of the things I find most interesting is that the DSA and DMA really, it, to me, it reads like an omnibus package of some of the best um, pieces of legislation that are before Congress. So today the Senate is marking up uh, the Platform Accountability and Transparency Act, um, which enshrines a lot of, you know, would enshrine a lot of similar um, transparency mechanisms that are included in the Digital Services Act. Um, that's a bipartisan bill from Senator Portman is supporting along with uh, Senator Coons and Senator Klobuchar. Um, there, there is, you know, risk assessments are sort of, and, and independent auditing are sort of central to uh, the bipartisan Kids Online Safety Act that, um, that Senator Blumenthal and uh, Blackburn have introduced. And, you know, the DMA, you know, I, I won't run through the full litany of everything, but here, but the DMA shares a lot of uh, qualities with the, the antitrust bill that Chris alluded to earlier, um, which takes direct aim at self-preferencing um, and other anti-competitive abuses in the digital market. Um, and so I think, you know, I wish that we were where we were further along and um, and that we had uh, more of a, as, as Chris said, a framework where the sort of a sweeping, you know, all of the above approach that really takes a, a comprehensive look at digital markets and how we need to rewrite the rules. Um, but the other point that I make to, to folks on the Hill is that if we don't make the rules, the rules are going to get rewritten without us. So, you know, I think, I hope that it is, at, at, if nothing else, a major impetus uh, for Congress to get their, get their act together and, and finally push some legislation across the finish line after years of talking about it. I'll, I'll kick it to Chris. Yeah, that was well put, uh, Jesse. Uh, I'll just add that um, for better or for worse, we, we we may need to um, we may need to advocate for and, and get our, uh, our 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 policymakers in Washington to um, start to build on the studies that have been done uh, in Europe that have been you know, we've had uh, you know an investigation in the House of Representatives here in Washington uh, that was excellent looking at some of the harms uh, purely competition harms. Um, around uh, tech accountability, um, but there's much more work that we need to do uh, to, to build on that, to look beyond competition harms uh, to actual consumer harms um, and and other uh, and other threats. So, um, you know, uh, you know, I'm encouraged. You know, when, when I say said before, I'm, I'm not encouraged in short run, but I'm encouraged in the long run. Um, the hope is that as as policymakers 
learn the details of what's happening in Europe, uh, that uh, they can see that many of the harms that they're concerned about with, uh, with the, the tech sector um, are being looked at uh, and, uh, and that they'll hopefully find interest in finding uh, you know, American style approaches to, to addressing those challenges. You know, we're already seeing the Federal Trade Commission, uh, for example, starting a proceeding to look at uh, 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 surveillance advertising uh, and whether or not there could be a ban, should be a ban, um, something, something, you know, short of a ban. Um, uh, you know, these sorts of analyses and studies are important. This is why we've called for years to have an expert digital regulator for tech platforms, um, because we're just not seeing uh, Congress keeping up with the pace of technology, technological change um, and changes in the marketplace. And so while there, there is increasing interest, um, uh, I would hope that you know, the work at the FTC or, or the empowerment of an expert regulator could go a long way to creating the sort of, of trust uh, in the analysis of the marketplace that our policymakers in the US will trust uh, rather than feeling that they're, they're somehow a threat uh, from the European analysis to uh, to American com companies. Um, when we hear American legislators talk about uh, digital harms, they're often the same ones they're seeing in Europe, but then somehow uh, this protectionism uh, comes about and we just, we just have to find our way around that. Natalie, I think you're muted. Uh, Karajina, you have a question? Uh, just follow up to um, uh, what Chris just said uh, would be really extremely helpful for the debate we have in Europe to, to gather more evidence from the industry of how alternative, more ethical business models play out in practice. We feel here in Europe that there is this Stockholm syndrome we observe, especially with electronic media, who uh, for ages have been critical of what the big tech's business model demands from them driving the quality of journalism down and making uh, chronic media uh, more and more economic dependent on clickbait, on the sensational emotional content, you know, everything we uh, uh, rightfully uh, criticize, especially in the times of information war. But at the same time, nobody seems to believe that the alternative, uh, economic alternative is viable, that we could move to contextual ads or um, profiling people based on their consent. Uh, uh, as if there was no economic evidence to back these claims. It's very difficult for us, the civil society, to come up to industry and say, hey, guys, we know better. We will now tell you how, how you do your business. So it, it's more likely that we just say, what are the red lines on civil society side? What are the safeguards? What are the prohibitions that we want the business to observe? But uh, it's not, it is ethical and, and and correct when we say so, but not, as, not, not, not extremely efficient if you want to convince policymakers to say, yeah, we are ready to, to, to execute the ban. So any uh, reliable uh, evidence uh, coming from US backing uh, that discussion against uh, surveillance um, advertising would be extremely useful. Thank you for that. Um, another, another really serious, I mean, all, all these news developments are very serious, right? Otherwise we wouldn't be so concerned about them. Um, another really serious development that's on my mind is, uh, is the, the, the news uh, based on a, on a Supreme Court leak uh, a few days ago that uh, the, the US Supreme Court appears poised to, to overturn Roe versus Wade uh, with uh, really severe consequences, not only for the right to abortion, but for reproductive rights, for a whole host of, um, of individual rights and liberties uh, that that the court has uh, has has recognized on the basis of of the same right to privacy uh, that that underpins uh, Roe versus Wade, and uh, there, as with all questions of of rights, there are implications to for for big tech uh, and big tech accountability and. Um, Unfortunately, this is another area where uh, where where we can look to to Europe for for lessons learned and and experience. Um, and and uh, Karajina, I know that you and your organization have done a great deal of work around uh, reproductive rights and 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 the right to information and and privacy online in that context. Um, what what advice do you have, or what lessons learned can you share with uh, with with American civil society groups and uh, and and uh, and individuals uh, in, in this context as we contemplate the possibility of, of Roe being overturned. 
Well, I guess it all starts with um, informing um, the society of what is really at stake and uh, preventing the debate from landing in extremes. Uh, the worst possible result, which we unfortunately observe in Poland, is that both sides of the debate uh, are using more and more radical uh, arguments and it's uh, less and less evidence-based or, uh, or more simply more emotional. So the, the, the same problem we've been observing um, in elections, uh, in um, uh, in the context of um, conflicts like like Ukrainian war, uh, the same, so to say, lack of possibility of meeting somewhere in the rational place to solve real problems. Th this is particularly uh, troubling. Uh, I would say, uh, being very liberal uh, in myself when it comes to reproductive rights, I have to admit that there are usually societal problems hidden behind uh, the other arguments, right? It, the, the other argumentation wouldn't exist in the society if there was no problem. Uh, so it's not just spin that we, are, uh, that we have to face from the other side. There are usually problems we need to understand while there is so little space in the debate for the two um, sides um, of the debate to, to meet and, and, and have honest conversations. So lack of these spaces, starting with social media, ending with the parliament, uh, I think this is the problem that needs to be tackled by civil society because we are the only ones who can create a forum for a more rational, less emotional uh, debate about very complex societal uh, challenges. Thank you, Kasia. Um, so another topic that uh, another hot topic in the past couple of weeks is, of course, uh, Elon Musk's uh, planned uh, acquisition of, of, of Twitter. Um, Sarah, from an investor perspective, what's your reaction to that? Like what what can we keep? Can, what does it look like keeping uh, a privately held Twitter accountable? Well, first of all, the situation with Twitter and Elon Musk is very concerning from the um, human rights standpoint and Musk has um, clearly stated his intention to limit content moderation as much as possible uh, in the name of free speech and this is very dangerous we know that uh, you know what happens when people can say whatever they want without safeguards um, and this interpretation of uh, free speech can lead to um, an increase of hate speech uh, disinformation and th this, this would have a uh, a direct impact on public opinion and democracy in general, uh, especially in the current circumstances we live in with the rise of extremisms and uh, division. Now, um, the offer has been made and Twitter accepted it. We should expect um, several things. So the first one is uh, regulators review of the transaction, um, but it is usually limited to competition and antitrust, is um, antitrust issues which are um, unlikely at stakes uh, in this case. And the second thing is shareholders approval of the transaction, which would take the form um, of a vote. We thought that we would have this vote at the upcoming AGM in May 25, but it doesn't seem like it. Um, so shareholders have the power to influence to some extent this transaction. Um, in their evaluation, they will, um, of course, take into account um, important financial considerations, uh, but also other non-financial considerations. Uh, as Musk takeover will likely have an important impact on the future of the company. So it is crucial uh, for shareholders to pay attention to um, you know, Elon Musk's plans for the company and how they would impact human rights. And if there will be no sufficient safeguards, it, it, it is very important for shareholders to oppose the takeover through their vote. Another thing to consider is that Elon Musk is considering taking the company private for three years to implement change uh, without shareholder scrutiny. So some would argue that uh, it would make these changes more efficient uh, because there wouldn't be shareholders to analyze, challenge, and approve or disapprove the company's plans. But we also could strongly argue that shareholders' ability to take an active part in Twitter's transformation would help the company to not lose sight of human rights risk. So what I see here is an attempt to, you know, severe shareholders' rights as much as possible uh, for Elon Musk to do whatever he wants with the company and then um, be um, you know, have this fait accompli, and we would, it, it would be too late, you know. 
Thank you. Um, before we move to um, to concluding remarks, um, I just want to see if any of you have have any uh, clarifying questions for for each other. Um, okay. So so I like to I, I want to to give everybody a chance to uh, kind of um, sum up kind of their their takeaways from from this conversation um, and uh, and either um, you know kind of um, you know. Yeah, I'd, li I'd like everybody to share what what you need from your allies, right? Like this is a movement where we all have different roles to play, different strengths, different uh, positionalities. Um, and uh, one thing that 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 I'm hearing is that um, you know groups like rank, like ranking digital rights uh, that that really straddle the line between research and advocacy that um, that we need to do a better job uh, surfacing uh, the academic research uh, and re and 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 other types of, of civil society research into. Um, in, into the public conversation, right? Uh, someone in uh, in the audience uh, highlighted that it's it's not entirely true that that anecdotal evidence that only anecdotal evidence exists of platform harms. Though it is true that that's what hits the news, uh, and there but and that there are academic publications, free software for collecting evidence on uh, various types of harms in a systematic matter, um, but it doesn't make it into the news. It doesn't make it into the policy conversation. And I think that's something that, that RDR as well as others can, can do a better job of, of being the pipeline that gets that, that knowledge from the academy to, uh, to the public policy conversation. Um, so I'll, I'll go in, uh, in reverse alphabetical uh, order for once. Um, so starting with Sophie, what, um, what do you need? What are either your takeaways from this conversation or something that you need from your allies in the movement to, to play your own role better? I think that's something that would be helpful. It's just increasing general understanding of the situation and the different dynamics at play because there are a lot of different subjects that get dumped together under the under the umbrella of digital rights or or, or technical accountability or etc it includes everything for, everything from user rights transpar transparency on terms of service to pri to privacy protections to to issues like hate speech and misinformation to issues like inauthentic accounts which is what i personally worked on and many others, and often, often, oftentimes, when people think of it, invite me to to panels or presentations or talks, they have completely the wrong idea of what I of what I work on, and they and they give me a prompt of for uh, for, for for on something like uh, based on your expertise working on artificial intelligence, and I'm like, no, I did not work on artificial intelligence at all. That's I I I no. Or etc. Or misinformation, or hate speech, or etc. Like these, like, like you have to understand a problem before you can solve it in the first place. And there are a lot of different problems that are put together under the same umbrella currently that are actually, in many ways, very different problems that have the, that have different solutions. Many people have suggested breaking up Facebook and social media companies. That is a problem that, that is a solution that solves exactly one problem, which is social media companies are too powerful. Others, it doesn't do anything to address the others. So just, but to understanding, it's my, my, it's my conclusion. That's what's needed anyways. Right, and, and to clarify, I think what you meant was that uh, Breaking up Meta would not is not a silver bullet. It would solve the problem of too much power, but we would still have many other problems that we would need to use different solutions to address. Great, um, Katarzyna, what's your takeaway or your or your ask? Thank you for a super interesting debate. Uh, I would say two things uh, in terms of pursuing our mission and having uh, more evidence to say what we want to say to policymakers. Never enough evidence uh, of social harm more than individual harms. Individual harms is super difficult to document and also not very convincing in the times where people get killed. Uh, and, and, and we have a uh, huge storm coming up also here in Europe. Maybe societal harms are the only ones that can speak to policymakers. So more documentation of that. Uh, we are even preparing for one project with Global Witness documenting how um, newsfeed on, uh, on Facebook, the way it is moderated, uh, pushes disinformation more, um, you know, up the feed, a uh, simple thing, but uh, again, we, we need to keep documenting that. So the more sources, the more evidence proving these issues uh, connected to how 
social media work with your engines uh, will be extremely useful. The other um, terrain where we need more evidence is mm, proving that alternative internet, alternative business models are possible. So everything that can prove our concepts that, that something else, something more healthy, something more sustainable, more privacy uh, preserving is possible, exists somewhere and is also economically viable would be incredible. Uh, speaking to breaking up Facebook, we also have been against that claim for a long time. We tried to push for a mo mo modular separation or separating layers of something like Facebook to enable competition within each and every layer, including algorithms and interfaces. I still believe it's an excellent idea, but people simply don't understand that. So whatever we can do, especially coming from the business side, uh, to prove or explain these concepts in practice would be incredibly helpful to push that debate beyond uh, just complaining. Chris? Um, there's so much work to do. Uh, just to pick up where Kasha left off, uh, to move beyond complaining, I think is really important with the public. Um, and so I agree with your point about um, making studies available um, helping the public understand that there are solutions out here. I, I feel like a lot of the public feels powerless um, uh, in, in, a, in a world where they don't trust government right now. Um, and, and the real options for who to empower um, you know, are, are limited. It's, it's either government companies or the public. Um, and and uh, empowering one or, or, or having one, the other completely unempowered uh, I think leaves us with a, a power imbalance that that exacerbates problems like disinformation. Um, so, um, so we have a lot of work to do to help the public understand um, that there uh, there's a role for for them. Uh, there's a role for uh, the the government, hopefully democratic governance, uh, the, that can that can also uh, empower them. Um, and, and that there's a role for setting expectations on platforms uh, to use their power in a way that meets public expectations. So we have a lot of work to do to get folks talking together. Um, uh, and, and those conversations uh, are also hopefully um, in the US context going to help bridge some of the ideological divides that we have uh, because we simply have folks who, who are living in, in different uh, information bubbles. Um, and so to break through that uh, is, a, is a challenge that civil society has to take on. Definitely. Uh, Jesse. Yeah, I mean, I think just to continue building on what Chris was just saying, I mean, I think we all have have work to do in terms of continuing these dialogues outside of our own echo chambers, not just on social media, but, you know, we have a tendency in the advocacy world to talk to ourselves um, and it might feel good or it might be a, a, a fun way to spend time sitting around and debating these things with people who agree with us, but it's not a good way to make progress. And I think in particular, you know, especially being a straight white man, like I, I've been in a lot of rooms where there's so many people, especially on this issue, you know, I know this is pervasive across society, but especially on tech issues, you know, where the whole room looks like me and we're sitting around talking about how to protect people from online voter suppression. And I'm like, you know, so and I think until we do the work to make sure that like everyone, that, that we're doing the outreach, doing the education, doing the, doing the coalition building that, it, that is really necessary to make progress, but not only to make progress, but to get it right. Because at the end of the day, the people that are bearing the brunt of all of the harms that we're talking about all the time are, they're not me, right? They're like communities of color. They're the people of Honduras and Azerbaijan where Facebook hasn't invested any resources. They're LGBTQ communities. They're, you know, and so we need to do a better job of getting outside of that sort of like tech policy bubble and figuring out how to both bring people to the table to make help make have their voice as we make those decisions and to communicate to the broader public as Chris was saying because it's going to take all of us to get to make progress and to make sure that that progress is equitable and advances the things that we care about deeply and not just you know more of the status quo yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, you know it's when 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 I first started working in this in this field uh, about ten years ago, there was very clearly like a, there's there's human rights and there's digital rights online, 
and uh, you know there were tech tech issues and all other issues. And you know that that line was always kind of flimsy and not entirely grounded in reality. Uh, now it's completely gone, and there there are still people who think it's there. And I think we need to really educate people that it's not about rights online; it's about rights, right? Like the problem with, with harmful speech is not that it exists on the internet, right? And yeah, I hear a lot of people, uh, including in Congress, act like, you know, the, the, pro the real problem is that there's images of child abuse on the internet. No, that's a manifestation of the real problem, which is that children are being abused. And you can extrapolate that to any issue that, that we're concerned about here, right? And so I think it's, it's, as you're saying, it's really important to break down these barriers and to communicate, to work hand in hand with the reproductive rights movement, with the environmental movement, the voting rights movement, immigrants rights, I mean, the LGBT rights. I'm not going to try to list all the groups that, that we're concerned about here because we'd be here all day, um, but I couldn't agree more. Um, Sarah, as an investor, what, what kind of help can, uh, can civil society groups or, or whistleblowers or other types of actors in our movement uh, do to, to, to help you and, and others like you hold companies accountable as using your power as investors? Yeah, sure. So uh, as I said, I think investors have a lot of power um, because they, um, they can directly influence companies' behavior and uh, decisions. Uh, but we wouldn't be able to do that uh, appropriately without uh, the help, uh, the support of civil society actors and academics. We, we're not experts, we cannot be experts in anything. Um, and we're here to listen, to understand, and to facilitate that conversation between um, the civil society actors and uh, economic actors. And uh, the ranking digital team has been instrumental in the filing on several um, shareholders' proposal this year um, on several issues. And thanks to that, like thanks to that sort of, I don't know, dynamic, we were able to to bring to um, you know companies management and boards some human rights issues uh, that I think would have taken more time uh, for them to uh, you know to 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 address. Um, so I guess this is just my way to say thank you and let's keep going that conversation. Well, you're most welcome, Sarah. You you and all the other investors have been a, a really tremendous partners uh, for us, uh, especially over, over the past year. Um, I'm conscious of time and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So I want to uh, to end by, uh, by thanking uh, all of our uh, amazing panelists. Uh, it's always been a joy every time I've spoken to each of you individually and having you all together as a group has been a, a, a real treat. Uh, thank you uh, again to, to our funders uh, for making our work possible. Uh, the biggest thanks of all to the ranking digital rights team who've been uh, doing all the hard work uh, for the past year and, and before even before that, uh, figuring out the methodology, doing the data collection, figuring out the insights, keeping our tech working, um, all, of, all of the work that, that goes into, into producing um, the research that that Jessica um, that Jessica shared uh, today. Um, this is just the beginning of the conversation, uh, including with with those of you in the audience. And uh, I look forward to to continuing in the weeks and months to come. Thanks. <laughs>